people for almost four years now, we have been doing this service on Wednesdays, and we have called it a service of prayer or intercessory prayer and Eucharist. I don't know if you've ever stopped to talk about what intercessory prayer is or why it is we're doing this every week. And perhaps to look at the example we have in the gospel this morning to see how you might or might not want to do your intercessory prayer. But first, th th you should know that there are multiple kinds of prayer. Uh, I, I, my conscience is pricked now after two weeks of talking about silence every morning, how little silent prayer I actually do and how difficult it is really to do it. There's something called contemplative prayer, which doesn't really have any words at all. It's simply the practice of trying to be in the presence of God and be still. And you can imagine, for one who talks for a living, how difficult it is to be still. And I think perhaps I can see some smiles and nods. You know what I'm talking about. It's not the easiest kind of prayer, and yet it is an important one. For those of us who really do need to slow down, there's also something that in technical lingo is called canonical prayer. The most common form of it you might know is saying the rosary. The purpose of saying the rosary, saying the same prayer again and again, is to quiet our thoughts, to help focus us. The, the, the repetition is a way of allowing God to get a word in edgewise because we are at least not going in a hundred directions at once. But neither of those is what we're doing here when we pray together on Wednesdays. This is intercessory prayer. This is probably the most common form of prayer and one that we have very good biblical authority to do, praying for others, whether we're praying for individuals or we're praying for classes of people like the poor or those who are in danger, or those who are sick, whether we're praying for problems in the world like violence, or if we're praying for those needs that we don't even know about. An important way of interceding for others is to ask for things that only God knows about, that God will somehow meet those needs. It's very important, and, and from the very beginning, from the time of St. Augustine at least, and probably earlier than that and down to today, we have been reminded by theologians that we're not really telling God what to do when we pray in this way. I think St. Augustine famously said that we, we can't tell God to do better. I have more than once, for humorous effect, talked in my sermons about how if only God would do it my way, the world would just be better. This is what we're getting at here. We're not really telling God what God should do. St. Augustine also said that when we pray in this way, it's not to acquaint God with our opinions, but rather to align our opinions with God's. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? That when we're praying for so-and-so who's sick or so-and-so who's in some difficulty, in reality what we're doing, although we don't realize it, is coming somehow into better alignment with what it is God desires for the world. And cl clearly, God desires healing for the world, and God desires the end of suffering of all kinds, and the building up of good of all kinds. So perhaps by those individual prayers, we are coming to have a better understanding of that. Maybe seeing it in a broader context than just the one person or just the one cause we're praying for. The mother of, the, of James and John in the, the lesson today is doing this. She's coming to Jesus saying, I want you to do something for me. She's praying on their behalf. Now, it's a little bit direct. And we know from another gospel that in another case, the story is they went to him directly, these two guys, and said, give us what we want. Here, at least, there's this one step of intercession between them and, and God in person. So at least somebody is doing the praying on their behalf. But still, you can read in Jesus' reply this idea that, no, this will be according to the will of God. There's no reason not to ask. When, uh, he doesn't criticize her for asking. He doesn't criticize them for asking. That's other people who get angry that they did it. Instead, it's a, a way of saying, okay, pray for whatever you see as being the needs of the world, but understand that what you're doing is coming better into alignment with what God desires the will of God for the world. This becomes important for us today because we will take on a new thing that we're praying for today. It has now been, we have received official permission from the bishop to begin praying for Kristen as she begins to discern whether she is called to be ordained. 
a big piece of what other people do for us as we go through that process. And any time we discern anything that God is calling us to do is pray for us again and again and again that wisdom will come into that. So we have a, a, an object lesson today of, of, of something we can do. A chance to, to practice this. To say to God, I'm praying for this person and for this need, in addition to all the others that we have every week. But also to let God begin to speak. And hear God speaking to Kristen and to us as we discern what it is God desires for her and for all of us. So I hope that as we go through these prayers week by week, they're going to begin to knock some of the rough, rough edges off of us. Perhaps better align our wills with God's. We could ask for nothing better, I think. Amen.